Hey guys and ladies, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we have a very special video for you guys because we're going to be talking about a new Arige Le Doré fragrance. And, you know, whenever I wear these Russian Atom creations, these Arige Le Dorés, I always feel like I am, you know, a young child exploring the world for the very first time. And I'm somebody who's smelled hundreds, if not thousands of perfumes uh, over the last decade or so of, of my journey. And I have to tell you that uh, I love learning new things and I love discovering new things. And whenever I wear these Arige Le Dorés, it's always something new to discover. And I really feel like I am a child sitting in class, you know, listening to the master, listening to the teacher speak uh, when I wear these. They are just um, such a joy and a delight and actually an honor and a privilege. I'm actually very honored and privileged to be able to talk about this on YouTube. Uh, and this is one such fragrance that deserves to be talked about a little bit more. It is hard to get now. There was only one edition of it made. Uh, and this is the original Agar de Noir from 2020. Look at this bottle. Look how beautiful that is. Uh, just almost a piece of artwork in and of itself. I did buy a partial bottle and I sprayed this again about an hour ago. Look at that. Look at the sheen. This is a very thick perfume, as you can see. It's almost black. Uh, and Agra de Noir came out in 2020. And so this fragrance um, is starting to feel kind of like a, a Rige Le Dore DNA, if you will. Now, yesterday I reviewed a perfume called uh, Chypre Extraordinaire by Roja Dove. And I had been wanting to talk about that fragrance on the channel for a little bit. But every time I kind of got stumped because I didn't know what to say. It was lifeless. It was boring. It was soulless. It didn't move me. Um, I didn't want to just come out and say that though, uh, so I kind of talked in circles for 45 minutes, but in, I rambled, if you will, uh, Ramsey the Rambler, and so this is going to be the exact opposite of that. Wearing stuff like this really fills me with passion and excitement, and sometimes, you know, in a, in a world where thousands of perfumes are released each year, using the same molecules from the same big oil houses, smelling something like this is almost like it just clears the mind. It, it brings you back down. It, it it grounds you. You know, it roots you. And that's what this fragrance does for me. So basically, um, Agra de Noir, and I'm going to pull up on the Arige Le Dore uh, website while I'm chatting. I should, I should have done that before I hit play. Um, but Agra de Noir, because I want to read you guys the... Um, I want to read you guys the blurb if possible. So basically what it opens up as, and if you've smelled some of his previous uh, works, you will get, uh, you'll kind of get a, uh, you'll get a reminder of some of his previous works. And it opens up with this chocolatey lava like feel. And if you've smelled some of his old work, like for example, if you know this right here, this Russian nude, this is the very first thing that popped into my mind the very first time I smelled Agar de Noir is Russian nude. I went, ah, okay, this, you know, chocolatey, lava-like, um, you know, signature DNA that really feels like it's starting to get attached to him by this point because Russian nude was uh, many years before Agar de Noir, okay? And so the feeling will, you, you'll almost have a little bit of a memory and I wrote out this entire page along with another page to discuss with you guys um, and then I went and watched the reviews and I was very uh, excited to see that Peter from Fragrance View basically said the exact same thing that I said. He said that when he sprayed it he got this initial uh, flashbulb reminder of Russian nude and then it went away. And uh, he's exactly right. It does go away after that, but it seems to kind of continually come back because that DNA is prevalent throughout the scent. So here, what makes Agar de Noir so different, I'm going to take the bottle out. And again, I mean, just I love the, the presentation. We'll talk about the notes here in just a little bit. But uh, this is what the bottle looks like out of its little tomb. And again, I only bought a partial because this stuff is very expensive and hard to come by. But... Um, Look at this, just absolutely beautiful. Feels perfect in the hand. Um, just the bottle is a work of art. And shout out to uh, Russian Adam for really wanting to put 
you know, the time and effort and the extra money it spends to, to make something like this because he easily could have done more stock bottles and probably saved a lot more on money. But I love that he wants to put the time and, and presentation into these bottles. And it definitely shows. The calligraphy on the cap and the way Agar de Noir is written, you know, it, it looks like just a work of art. And it, it is a work of art. So the biggest note with Agar de Noir that you're that you know for me is kind of a, a selling point is the coffee. I never got a chance to smell Oud Luwak, his other coffee scent. And so for me, uh, Agar de Noir was uh, from the sixth collection. And um, it, it was my way to kind of smell my very first uh, coffee fragrance by Russian Adam. And so you're going to get this very dark coffee note from the very beginning. And I've smelled some coffee fragrances before. I've done a, this is not a top, I think I did a, this is not a top 10 coffee list. If I haven't, I just ranked my uh, tea fragrances and five o'clock Ocean Jamber came in number one, but there was an entire, I think 21 tea fragrances that I ranked. And uh, I'm gonna rank my coffee fragrances as well if I haven't done that yet. But this is one of my favorite coffee fragrances of all time. This is uh, Cristobal. By Balenciaga. This has both tea and coffee. Cristobal Poron, sorry. This has both tea and coffee. Uh, another one that would vibe for my favorite coffee fragrance of all time would be this. And this is Trussardi Inside Man. And look at the inside of the bottle. It almost looks like this crocodile snake skin. But this opens up with this unsweetened... Uh, Italian espresso is what it feels like to me. And I love that type of coffee. That's the type of coffee that I really like. Cristobal has a little bit more sweetness to it. Uh, Trussardi inside opens up with that type of coffee that I really, really like. Dark, deep, dark, roasted, almost burnt coffee bean feeling, right? And that's what you get from uh, Agar de Noir. Is you get this deep, dark, rich... Um, you know, it's it smells like a it smells like a um, dark espresso bean, like an extremely dark, like a triple shot of espresso. With the most important part to me is unsweet. It is unsweet, and that just put a big smile on my face because if you know me, you know I do not like sweet perfumes normally, uh, and. This fragrance is going to go through a journey which will actually bring in a lot of gourmand-like notes. And yet the beauty of this fragrance for me is even though it brings in a lot of those sweeter gourmand notes, it never becomes sweet or cloying. And that's why I'm a big fan of, uh, of Agar de Noir. So uh, this instantly becomes one of my favorite coffee perfumes out of the gate, just right away. Almost maybe even straight to the top of the list. Uh, but I have yet to smell Oud Luwak, so I can't really proclaim it as the best coffee uh, fragrance from, from Russian Adam yet. And so along with this dark coffee, you're going to get some Oud. And the Oud here is from Laos in India. And actually, that's exactly what it says. It says Oud from Laos in India. And that's pretty much it. Um, excuse me. I don't know the exact types of oud that, that was used, but I can tell you just kind of how it makes me feel. It's a very polite oud. It's an oud that um, doesn't have the barnyard facets of, you know, uh, something like Chinese oud, or maybe even if you look at something like uh, oud zen that he did. There's actually some similarities to oud zen too, I think, but it doesn't have, oud zen has much more of that barnyardy, uh, you know, fertilizer chips, uh, that Indian barnyard oud. Even though this is Indian oud listed here, he managed to use a, um, he managed to use a type of Indian oud, which is very respectful of the coffee. So there's a little bit of skank and it's, like I said, it's a polite oud, but there is a little bit of skank, but it never interferes with the integrity of the perfume. And that's one of the most important parts to me in wearing this for the first time today. I wore this to church and I felt absolutely at home with it, okay? There was no, um, you know, there was nothing that ever made me feel out of place. 
the skank was almost almost like it was right there in the background where if you could just kind of flip the page or blow a feather that's uncovering it, it would just appear, but it never does. It stays in the background. The skank is always uh, in the background. It never makes itself really known. Almost like a real Ood lover could pick out that the outline of the skank, um, but you never get that barnyard Ood, which I love. I, I actually really like that kind of Ood. And we'll get to that later on as well. So, um, it's just a brilliant composition. I mean, it, it just talking from the heart, uh, this is the kind of stuff, like I said, that really puts a smile on my face. It really moves me. There's very, once you get to smell lots and lots of fragrances, uh, it takes a lot to really get you excited. And usually the stuff that gets me excited the most is the heavy animalic challenging ouds and castoriums and civets and stuff like that. And the fact that this excites me without any of that, it does have some ambergris, which we'll get to once we start talking about the heart notes. Um, but it's just a brilliant composition. So the spice mixture is probably one of the most important parts of the opening. And this opening employs some spice mixtures that I'm actually unfamiliar with. There's some there's some notes listed that are um, that are kind of uh, foreign to me. I had to look them up. Some of the names were written differently than the name of the ingredients that I'm used to I'm used to hearing. Um, but the spice mixture, basically, what you end up getting is it adds this warmth and this almost underlying like. Um, green spiciness to the to the perfume there's a bit of uh dark green i almost thought when before if i just kind of close my eyes smell this before i even look at the note listing i almost thought there was a little bit of vetiver in here but there's not there's a couple notes that i think maybe do what vetiver would do in a different composition and i would love to have russian adam talk about this one day with us but um or maybe i can ask him and he can and let me know and I can kind of pass along the information to you guys. But it, um, it, it almost feels like that smoky, earthy um, rootiness that some types of vetiver give you with a little bit of green is here. But there's no vetiver, if that makes sense. But the spice mixture in the beginning is uh, a big part of the opening. It's, uh, it adds a, a bit of warmth, very much needed warmth, because... When you first spray, you get that lava-like uh, ambery-ness that you have kind of come to expect from uh, from some of his compositions, like Russian Oud, if you've smelled this, you know. And, um, and then it, it kind of joins in with the spices. And like I said, there's some spices that I'm not familiar with. For example, there is a note of Arnica. And Arnica is a genus of sunflowers, if I'm not mistaken. Do correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's a genus of sunflowers. And apparently, it's supposed to have, the entire plant has this very strong pine slash sage-like smell. And actually, that green pine slash sage smell, I think, plays a pretty important part in the opening because that may be that green bit that I was kind of picking up. It might be a little bit of the Arnica. And um, there's also a note of Calamus. And calamus kind of adds this herbal, warm, spicy smell to it. So that's part, calamus I think is maybe even a bigger part of the opening than, um, than Arnicus. And calamus uh, was actually used in ancient Mesopotamia uh, in incense mixtures. And it was used by the uh, ancient Egyptians in their kaifi mixtures. And so uh, calamus is, has this almost like um, wet dough type smell. So if you think about, uh, for me, the image that kind of came to my mind when I think about calamus is imagine, have you ever seen people making like a clay pot and they're kind of the, the pot spinning on the thing? I don't even know what it's called, uh, but the, the, the pot is spinning and they're kind of shaping the clay pot and there's water and they're kind of putting water on it and the, plot, the pot is being shaped. Imagine that wet dough-like feeling uh, while it's being shaped before it hardens into the clay pot. That's the texture of calamus in this perfume. But I want you to imagine it as warm, herbal, and spicy smell. And 
that's kind of what you get in the opening. And um, interestingly enough, though, it also has these leathery-like effects, okay? So the calamus can smell almost like this um, leathery suede-like effect, and, there's, and, and that's a big part of the fragrance as well, uh, because there is this leathery... Once it really starts to dry down as the hours tick by, look at this. This is a five and a half hour dry down. Look at this. You can still almost see the outline on my skin from, from where I sprayed it earlier. This was a spray from an hour ago, but this is a five and a half hour dry down. Look at this. Um, and you get, as it continues to dry, you get more and more and more of these um, leathery, uh, smoky, musky, you know, it just kind of dries down to this, um, this caramelly, like leathery, smoky thing. And, 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 and it's beautiful. It actually is really beautiful. Um, so as the fragrance continues to dry and you get past that first hour opening, once you slip past the first hour, you'll notice the arrival of what I initially thought of was this woodiness from the oud. And it very well may have played a part in the fragrance, uh, the, the woodiness from the oud, because I mentioned that it's got uh, Laotian oud, and it has Indian oud, okay? And so there could have been this general woodiness uh, from the oud, this, this, but also the other thing to mention is that calamus can sometimes come across as having these woody aspects. It can also have this slightly rooty undertow. And so the calamus having that slightly rooty undertow could be the bit of the vetiver that I thought I was picking up. And you can see my excitement. I mean, go compare my review from Shepra Extraordinaire yesterday where I was just kind of bumbling through it. And um, really, all I wanted to say was that it's not worth it. Uh, that it, the, the price is uh, out of this world. At, at one, You know, for Shepra Extraordinaire, my review from yesterday... I mentioned the problem about price, 1,750 pounds, and then they dropped it to 750 pounds, but it just, it didn't move me at all. This fragrance moves me. There's passion behind it, and that's why Russian Adam's work is so special to me, and that's why I say I feel like a kid in the classroom, you know, uh, learning about something new, and still, after all of these fragrances I've smelled, there's still so much more of his work to get to uncover, and and it's, um, uh, it's nowadays it's rare because... So many people put the emphasis on just moving bottles, selling bottles, selling units, discontinuing something, putting something out that smells the same and putting a new name and marketing campaign behind it and selling units. And, you know, the care and the love and the attention to detail and the um, ingredients, the ingredients are out of this world. It's so, so good. And so the last little spice note you'll smell right around the first hour mark or so uh, is a note that's called... Crataegus, and it's actually spelled out right here, Crataegus, uh, and where, there it is, Crataegus, and so Crataegus, uh, I had to look it up because I was like, what the hell is this, and so apparently Crataegus is basically more commonly referred to as the note of Hawthorne. Now, Hawthorne, you all probably know if you've been watching my channel, Hawthorne is very famously used in fragrances like Après Londe from Guerlain, uh, from 1906, I believe. It's also very famously used in Quirange by the Hermesens line. This is uh, my favorite Hermesens fragrance. Um, and, you know, normally when I think of Hawthorne, uh, it almost adds this white, almost pure like vibe. White and pure are the, um, are the words that kind of come to my mind when I think of Hawthorne. Um, and the Hawthorne and Queer Ange, just as an example, since the Hawthorne plays such a big part in Jean-Claude Elena's Queer Ange, is, um, or Angel Leather, if you will. Uh, the Hawthorne and Queer Ange has this almost white, beige, soft, calf-like leather, is the image that comes to mind. And when I think of Hawthorne and that white, calf-like leather, I think of it as almost like a perfect sidekick. This fragrance, Agar de Noir, has this calf-like leather dry down, but it doesn't have the whiteness of it. It doesn't have the white purity of it. But Hawthorne is almost fighting this battle against this dark, you know. You think about Hawthorne, and, and I mentioned Angel, right? And then you think about this dark colored juice, and the Hawthorne is um, 
almost fighting this unwinnable battle in this perfume because obviously the darker, heavier aspects are going to win out, but it is in there. And, you know, it could just add a little bit of contrast, if you will. Um, and so basically it can also, one thing Hawthorne can also add that I should mention is it has this soft, light, almost heavenly floral smell, but it can also be uh, musky and leathery on its own. Hawthorne can add to the leathery feeling, that musky feeling that you're smelling in Agra de Noir. There's also a note of uh, Columba, and it's right here. You can see Columba, and I have no clue what that is. I had to look it up. Apparently, um, Columba is some sort of incense or used as an incense. I'll have to get with Russian Adam on that one and see where you know what he says about that. Um, and, and kind of get back to you because I, I couldn't really find much on it. But um, once we get past this kind of bouquet of unique spices in the first hour or so, then we get to the heart of the perfume. And let me read you the notes. Actually, I haven't even read them to you. So this is actually from the bottle itself. It says, uh, the top notes are vintage spice tinctures of cardamom, arnica, calamus, crataegus, which is the hawthorn, columba, which is that incense-like feeling, and guyac wood. The heart is oud from Laos and India, vintage Arabia and violet accords from 1920, co-absolute of saffron, coffee and ambergris crafted by Russian Adam, and the base notes are peru balsam, benzoin, labdanum, and tonka beans. And um, so that kind of gives you an idea of the of the um, of the note listing. And the reason I wanted to read that to you is once you get into the uh, heart, once that first hour goes by, that's where really uh, the spice starts to blend with those heart notes even more. And uh, once you get past that bouquet of, of unique spices, you get into the heart of the perfume and many people bring up this note from, from what I've heard people talk about this fragrance. And it's that violet note, okay? And the violet note for me, sometimes it kind of peeks its head in and out as a Parma violet. Sometimes it's um, more, when I think about it, uh, for me, it's more a violet that is kind of dipped in this chocolatey saffron caramel blend and then brewed in a thousand dollar Italian espresso machine. That's kind of what the violet smells like to me. It's here. But it's very hard to single it out when all of these other notes are making that, you know, chocolatey, ambery, um, you know, uh, that lava-like feeling that I've mentioned before when I discussed Russian oud. It's really the best way to describe it, that chocolatey, lava-like feeling. I mean, the darkness of, of the juice of Agar de Noir even puts the juice of, um, you know, Russian oud to scent to shame. You can see how much darker this is. And um, so more of the second stage of this perfume kind of takes over from the opening and more and more it tends to bring in these gourmand notes. So as you get deeper into the dry down, you basically will begin to notice more and more of these resins and this uh, gourmand notes, okay? This darkness. Uh, begins to kind of take over. And what you end up smelling as it gets closer and closer to the dry down. So this is a six hour dry down. And what you'll smell more and more is you're going to smell more of this honeyed like benzoin. This benzoin begins to bring in this honeyed like note, almost like the thickest honey you can imagine. Just imagine, I mean, um, almost like honey paste, if you will, very thick. And the labdanum starts to smell slightly sweet, almost like um, the person sipping that bitter espresso that I talked about earlier adds a few spoons of sugar. He or she is sick of uh, the, the bitterness and they want to add a couple spoons of sugar. And yet, it's not enough, right? The, the bitter espresso is still there, even with the couple spoons of sugar added. Uh, you can still detect that bitter espresso in, in the background. And that's kind of how the fragrance acts. And that's kind of how the fragrance acts because um, even with the sweeter notes coming through, peru balsam, benzoin, labdanum, tonka bean, 
This never turns too sweet for me. It never turns cloying. Uh, and that's kind of the brilliance of this fragrance for me is the sweeter gourmand notes start to shine through. Uh, but the fragrance remains dry and smoky and leathery. And I mean, almost a perfect gourmand for my taste, almost a perfect gourmand. And I wouldn't, it's hard to call it a gourmand because it never truly goes into gourmand territory. Even though it has coffee, most people think of gourmands as being very sweet. That's just the way most people think of them. They think of gourmands as edible pastries or cakes or, you know, um, something like that. This doesn't do that. It, it walks right up to that line, but Russian Adam stops it from going there. And I would attribute the fact that it never crosses that line, which is a good thing for me. I'm glad it doesn't cross that line to the high quality oud used in here. I don't think it would be possible to build, you know, such a fragrance with modern aroma chemicals because they would just come across smelling sweet. They would come across smelling sweet and synthetic. Uh, I don't think it would be possible to, to keep that dark, smoky, leathery, woody, uh, coffee, oud, you know, in, integrally sound. I don't think they, I don't think they could keep the fragrance, uh, true to itself with modern aroma chemicals, you know, and, and that's why this, um, brown, creamy, uh, almost dessert-like dry down, you, if you know my taste, you would, you would think it's something that, uh, I would hate. You would, you would look at this and go, oh, wow, Ramsey's not going to like this. It's too sweet for him. Not true at all. 100% not true. And that's kind of the brilliance of this fragrance. That's the yin and the yang um, is it, um, it's able to, it's able, because of the quality of the ingredients, I think it's able to keep that dry, smoky, woody, leathery, you know, even still somewhat spicy, but mostly uh, focuses more on the more gourmand textures of the dry down. So the peru balsam, the benzoin, the labdanum, the tonka. And that's why I really don't believe it's possible for a Dior or a Guerlain or, you know, um, someone like that to make this type of fragrance. I, I just, I don't think it's possible. And as a frag head, you know, someone left me a comment recent, recently um, saying, Ramsey, can you do a top 10 video on the most unique fragrances that you've ever smelled? Because I'm starting to feel like everything I'm smelling is similar. And I asked him, I said, are you only smelling modern perfume? Because if you're only smelling modern perfume, it does all smell similar. The houses copy each other. The oil houses they buy from, Givaudan, IFF, um, you know, uh, Robert Tett, they all use the same uh, type of molecules. They all sell their molecules to all the big houses. And, you know, uh, the fragrances come out smelling the same, even though the perfumers you're smelling may try and do different things. They're using the same ingredients. And those ingredients are coming from the big oil houses. Uh, and so because of that, everything starts to smell the same in modern perfumery. It just does. Uh, and so if you're someone that loves perfume for the art of perfume, okay, if you're someone who, uh, if you're someone who is not buying perfume for compliments, if you're someone who wants to kind of take the next step, you have two choices, in my opinion. You can go back to the future and go back in time, go back to the old days, go back to the 20s and explore Guerlain, you know, go back to the 40s and 50s and explore Caron, go back to the 60s and 70s and explore Aramis. Uh, go back to the 70s and 80s and explore Van Cleef and Arpels or Chanel or Guerlain or whatever, you know, uh, go back in time and explore those those fragrances. Hugo Boss. People laugh sometimes when I tell them uh, Hugo Boss number one is one of my favorite fragrances. A lot of times they laugh. They, they didn't even know Hugo Boss was a good house because they put out such a joke of an offering over the last, you know, 20 years. It's been Boss Bottled Flankers and all this crap. The scent, Private Accord, this, that, whatever. And they all just smell terrible. They all smell the same. And so if you want 
to take the next step as a true fraghead, you have two choices. Go back to the past or go to houses like Arise the Doré, Russian Adam, or Bortnikov, or Ensar Ud. That's it. There's really little else to go now. Even the niche houses that you're going to find, they're starting to smell like more expensive designers. There's very little um, risk taking that's being done. You know, even a house like Amouage that used to take risks, they fired Christopher Chong, so you're not going to get those risks anymore from the new guys. Um, even the House of Roja, like I was talking about yesterday, you know, I mentioned Sheeper Extraordinaire, uh, my review from yesterday, which I don't think is one of my best, but I really don't have much words to say about it. It's just a boring. They wanted $1,750 for some boring, soulless, you know, doesn't move me at all. And... Uh, MFK, same thing, you know, um, Serge Luton doesn't even distribute anymore in the United States. I mean, I would say that Uncle Serge is a great house. When you could buy these little 50 mil bottles for 50 bucks, uh, it was a perfect house for a true frag head to explore and begin to break into and get to know Shed Guy, Ombre Sultan, Five O'Clock Ocean Jambra, you know, those kind of things. Um, Fila Nagil. now you can't do that. People want $750 for a vintage bottle of Filan Aguil. You know, it's insane, right? So where do you go? Where do you go? You go here, in my opinion. You go to you go to someone like Russian Adam, or you go to vintage. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of my take on it. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a sad state of affairs. But, um, you know, there's so much to learn. There's so much to discover. And... You know, even somebody like me, who, like I said, have, have smelled hundreds, if not thousands of different perfumes. When I smell some of these Russian Atom creations, it's like, it's like being in a classroom. It's like learning from the master. It's, it's learning from the legend. You know, it really is. It's an honor and a privilege to get to smell these. And this was not sent to me for a review. I bought this with my own money. Uh, and, you know, you're going to hear more about this house because there's more. I know I've been talking a lot about them. There's going to be more early impressions to come. I still have to get to know a couple others I've purchased. I haven't talked about on the channel yet. Siberian Summer and Musklov are coming. And um, I've got a lot of samples and stuff like that to go through with you guys. So there's going to be a lot of discovery that we're going to do together. But just remember my words if you are wanting, if you fall into that predicament, and you're wanting to smell something unique, and you're wanting to smell something different, and you're wanting to smell something that uh, moves you, and it feels like an art form. You have to either go to the past, or you've got to go indie. Now, there are some exceptions to the rule. I think the House of Papillon is a good ex exception to that rule, but most of the houses that you're going to find in the niche realm nowadays, um, creeds and stuff like that are they're not worth worth your time or your money don't waste your money on that that's part of the journey of discovery is knowing uh when to kind of back away from a brand knowing when what to buy knowing what to hunt for you know and everyone's hunt and everyone's tastes are going to be different uh and that's why no two collections are exactly alike i could have 500 bottles you could have 500 bottles and it wouldn't be exactly the same you know or if i could keep 50 bottles, I wouldn't keep the same 50 as you. Everyone's tastes are different. But this channel is kind of about highlighting my tastes and how I feel about stuff. Uh, and for me, this is the kind of stuff that I'm at the point in my journey where this or vintage is really what I want to be focusing on. Many of the new niche houses, you may see me talk about them, uh, but you're not going to see Zerzhov halls or anything like that on the channel. So, um, but yes, but we will talk. I'm open to talking about anything on the channel. But if you're going to watch my videos, uh, if I say something bad about a fragrance, please don't take it personally. I'm not attacking you. Uh, I'm not I'm not attacking who you are as a person if you like a fragrance. Uh, you know, it's 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 the it's the item itself that we're talking about. It's a consumer item, okay? So don't 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 get offended by by that or or, you know, you've got to you've got to understand that to have a review, to have a true review Sometimes it has to be negative. Sometimes it has to be positive. And so that's just that's just the way it's going to go on Channel Ram. So if you've had a chance to smell Agro de Noir, I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Uh, I'm so glad to have this little bottle I've been wearing. Today I've been wearing it off of uh, a little decant 
that Eddie made for me. Um, and so I've got the bottle here and I've been wearing it off of this little decant. But, uh, but yes, blessed and honored to get to know such a beautiful fragrance. Thanks to Russian Adam for putting this out. And uh, again, liking, subscribing, all the stuff that I'm not very good at talking about does help the channel. We're basically at 3,000 subscribers. So thank you to everyone who has supported me. Um, I'm still thinking about what to do for my 3,000 subscribers. You know, congratulations video. I have no clue what I'm going to do. Lots of ideas, but nothing's really stuck with me. I need to think about it. But um, if you have any ideas, leave it in the comments. And um, again, if you've smelled Agar de Noir or you've had experience with some of these Arige de Dores, I'd love to hear your thoughts. So cheers, guys. Thanks for watching. And hopefully, maybe after the Super Bowl, we'll do a post-Super Bowl stream tonight. Bye-bye. Take care. See you next time.